I'm going to talk about, you know, leading remote learning, but also what comes next. So uh, my name is Eric. I'm an associate partner with the International Center for Leadership and Education. Prior to this, I was a teacher and principal in the state of New Jersey, where we did a lot of transformational work uh, back in the mid to late 2000s while increasing achievements. But let's really look at this concept of, you know, where we are now, but more importantly, where we want to be. So as we think about, you know, when sort of the pandemic reached great heights in March, you know, everyone was sort of, you know, very concerned. We were kind of, maybe some cases we were caught with our pants down. But here's the thing, we weren't prepared for this. You know, and you heard both Joe and uh, Ken allude to that. But, you know, what was happening and what's still happening is educators were trying to fly the plane while building it at the same time. But here's what we learned, ladies and gentlemen. We learned that a virus cannot stop your commitment to kids. Teachers and administrators have stepped up. It's not about good or bad. It's about what you did and how the lengths that you went to keep learning going for your kids. So as we think about remote learning and why is it important to sort of, you know, talk about this now since some schools are over and some, or some are wrapping it up because we do not know what protocols will be in place uh, when schools reopen in the fall. I'm already working with school districts across the country on a hybrid plan. You know, what will it look like if social distancing is still in place? Some schools, correction, many schools will still be implementing remote learning. Here's what I do know. There is no one right way, everybody. The right way is your way. Think about what you have done up to this point. What was successful? What wasn't? And think about how you'll develop a plan for consensus as you go forward. You know, when we think about successful remote learning, it's not about pile on, piling on too much work for kids. It's about assigning up a manageable workload, not putting too much responsibility on parents. Why is that important? Because parents are working from home as well. You know, uh, we heard references uh, to equity uh, that Ken talked about before. We have to ensure equity. And here's what we realized. As we went to remote learning, millions of kids, millions of kids in the United States alone still do not have access to high quality Wi-Fi or internet devices. As educators, you got to determine what's feasible, digital, non-digital, or a blend, avoiding low level worksheets and packets. You know, we don't want to just focus on fill in the blank, multiple choice. We want to challenge our kids to think. I'll talk a little bit later about how we can utilize more uh, personalized, differentiated strategies such as playlists and choice boards. You know, playlists can be differentiated where kids select the order of the tasks that can have different uh, levels of difficulty, but they do all the tasks. With choice boards, kids select from say three of nine activities. And both playlists and choice boards are very popular blended learning strategies. Assigning independent reading with reflective questions. You know, also we have to figure out what tools are best. You probably dabbled with some tools, whether you're a teacher or you're, you saw what was being used in your school. You gotta figure out which ones actually get the most bang for your buck. In this case, everyone, less is more. We have to communicate consistently, excessively with stakeholders. Making time for check-ins. If our kids are still doing remote learning when schools reopen, we have to make sure we're checking in with them. We, you know, uh, we heard before about the whole social emotional learning aspect. That's why those check-ins are so important, even with uh, regular phone calls. If you're an administrator, we gotta be flexible with teachers. And one thing that I could say where there's a lot of room for growth with remote learning is making sure that accommodations for special education students are met. You know, when we think about practices to avoid, and I will tell you that I've reflected a little bit, um, but I'll get to that one point in a minute. We don't want to pile on too much work. We don't want to just to post assignments where there's no mechanisms for feedback. We don't want to just provide digital options because we have to be cognizant of screen time. I, for one, my eyes hurt all the time I'm spending in front of the screen. Now, I was anti-grading during remote learning, but I kind of changed my stance on that, and I'll kind of uh, come back to that. And a lot of the points that Ken, say, Ken uh, talked about previously will really resonate with my change of heart. Grading, it has to be fair, it has to be equitable, and it really has to be a culmination of, well, how are kids learning? You know, we don't want to just rely on low-level worksheets, packets. 
or low level teachers pay teachers materials. I'm not against teachers pay teachers materials, but we have to vet them, ladies and gentlemen. We have to make sure that they're actually challenging kids to think. We don't wanna think that we have to abide by a traditional school day schedule. We don't wanna force teachers to follow a traditional school day uh, schedule or working remotely. That's not how it works. When we're using video tools, like here, we're using Zoom. You gotta be 13 or older, everyone. If kids are using Zoom and they're younger than 13, that's a violation of FERPA and COPA. So we don't also want to post pictures and videos of kids learning online if we don't have consent. Always err on the side of caution. And also, you know, we heard the reference to priority standards. Don't think you have to cover the entire curriculum and every standard. So as we think about where we are now, but where we want to be, we want to make sure that with remote learning and any type of hybrid model or even face-to-face, -face, when we go back to it in our schools, does two things, everyone. It's empowering kids to think the uh, vertical axis, but also how are kids applying their thinking? You know, the doing the same old thing, a one size fits all approach, not getting kids to actually create, communicate, collaborate. You know, the idea here is not to prepare kids for something. How do we prepare kids for anything? And you do that by moving from quad A to C to B and to eventually D. And as we think about what we want, you know, and I saw some reference in the chat box here, you know, many kids don't have technology. Here in my district, we have kids that are 95% poverty. We have some kids that are only 5% poverty. So we have to go with a blended approach during our remote learning. And um, there's great ways we can still do effective remote learning without tech. You know, we might model through video or we do it through, you know, we do a direct instruction lesson. Well, here we have to write out the explanations, scaffolded questions and tasks, providing guided independent practice, authentic uh, challenge problems for kids to solve, independent reading, reflective questions, playlists, choice boards, get kids up and moving. And I loved how Joe had you guys get up and move. I hope you did that. And using reflective writing journals. Coming back to where the technology falls, why did I show you that image of the rigor relevance framework? Because ladies and gentlemen, it's not technology on one side, curriculum, instruction, and assessment on the other. It's about learning. And whether we're in a remote world or face-to-face, -face, we want to make sure that the technology is actually leading to a fundamental improvement in what we do. How are your kids learning with technology in ways that they couldn't without it? How does it allow you to do what you do better? And this was an image that, you know, I actually created once I came on board with the International Center, you know, taking those tenets, those core tenets of learning, thinking, application, and understanding that technology is just one tool, one resource. But what we've learned in a blended world is, you know, blended learning has really become the foundational pedagogical strategy. Blended instruction is what the teacher does with tech. Blended learning is where kids use technology to control path, pace, and place. There is a difference. But in a, uh, a remote world, these are the four main components. Synchronous instruction, using Zoom, Google Hangouts, Blue Jeans. Asynchronous work, where kids are engaged in a playlist, a choice board, or they're working on a project. But what we really need to focus on in the remote world is those collaborative experiences. How are we using technology to get kids that working at a distance to work together. And also the use of adaptive learning tools to differentiate, to provide us with data that can inform instruction and provide more support for those kids that need it the most. As I alluded to before with you know, remote learning and leading remote learning, we cannot forget about our kids with disabilities. Now, I just have some verbiage here that's basically copy and pasted from the US Department of Education. And what I did was kind of summarize it at the bottom. If your district or school has any sort of remote learning going on during a school closure for your regular ed kids, you have to provide accommodations for those that have IEPs in order to meet IDEA. So that's point number one. Point number two, when we think about meeting uh, the special needs of our kids, is you know changing the IEPs. If IEP teams can meet physically, all right, change them. But if not, use uh, Zoom, use Google Hangouts. But if you're using those video tools, make sure you have protocols in place 
to safeguard sensitive information. So summary before I kind of do my big wrap up, which I don't know if will be so big, that's up for you to decide. As you're leading remote learning, you know, think about your role. Are you a teacher leader, building leader, district leader? Be flexible. Lead through an empathetic lens. Learn what others are doing. That is your greatest resource. Don't reinvent the wheel. Implement realistic and fair grading that makes sense. And I'll just defer and say everything that Ken said before, do that. Connect with your families. Provide professional learning support. This, hey, teachers and administrators were not provided professional learning support during this crisis. We need to get it right. We can still use CARES money for another couple weeks, but you've got to build it into your long-term plans. Make sure students are safe online and make sure you teachers, your community, make sure that, and kids are exhibiting self-care. You know, we've seen COVID, we've seen the role of social media. We've also seen that not only with remote learning, kids, families are online more and more. So when you think about being safe, these are just some tips, everyone. If you're a parent, you're giving advice to your parents, grandparent, utilize strong passwords. Use a VPN uh, and antivirus protection for all devices. Regularly update your software. Upgrade the security of your home network. Always back up files offline, online. Manage social media profiles. Get the passwords of your kids if you're a parent. Tell your parents to. Check your security and privacy settings. Never open up suspicious emails or attachments. And do not friend anyone you don't know. Why is this important? Because as we continue with remote learning, we have to keep our kids safe. And I'm going to end with... Where do you go from here, everybody? Maslow's before blooms. You've probably heard that a lot. We've heard all of the, the surveys of how some teachers aren't, aren't going to be comfortable coming back to school. Parents aren't comfortable sending their kids back to school. This is why, first and foremost, we have to work on planning now to make sure our schools are safe. Engage with your stakeholders. Get their input. Make sure you're actually listening. Prioritize. As you engage and listen, think about what has to be done first. Come to a consensus. And you know what? All means all. When we think about health and safety, students, teachers, administrators, secretaries, bus drivers, grounds crew, cafeteria workers, we have to ensure the safety of all. And taking everything that you've heard from my fellow Avengers today and the ones that you've heard previously, you need to focus on what your re-entry plan is going to encompass. And this is not in an order, everybody. It's not one is the most important, but we have to focus on SEL. We have to make sure that we're addressed and close those learning gaps for some of our kids when they come. We have to make sure we're implementing pedagogically sound blended learning, ensuring equity, planning now for flexible, innovative sketch schedules for social distancing, looking at the budget. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. We're gonna have a budget crisis, everyone. We have to make sure that the money that we have is being spent on what we need. Look at those other items, but also think about how you're gonna provide the professional learning support for your teachers, for your administrators, for your community. I can't count how many virtual professional development sessions I've done for parents during this crisis. And throughout the process, think about how you're going to engage the community. All in all, everyone, it comes down to relationships. Without trust, there's no relationship. Without relationships, no real learning occurs. Always focus on that most important R. Yes, we want learning to be rigorous. We want it to be relevant, but without relationships in place, it doesn't really matter. So this is my last slide, and I will tell you that, um, you know, as we think about where we are now, and you think about your role, leadership is not about position, title, or power. Leadership is about action. And I never realized how <laughs> prominent and important this book was going to be when I did the new edition of Digital Leadership just two years ago. Uh, I should, sorry, a year ago. And I've been getting so much feedback from educators across the country and the world about how this is helping them get through this. Think about student learning, not just engagement learning. What does it look like? What do you want it to look like? How can you improve? How will you improve your physical learning spaces, but also your virtual learning spaces? How will you empower your educators to engage in meaningful professional learning that's job embedded and ongoing? How you communicate your successes and your challenges? How you take control and tell your story? You know, not just in our classroom with our kids, but to your greater community. What do you want your brand presence to be? You know, what messages you want out there? And finally, 
if we can't harness the inherent opportunity, yes, this has been a challenging time. It's been a challenging time with COVID. It's been a challenging time as we're battling with racism, but there is opportunity to get better, everybody.